All right. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I, this, I'm Keith, and uh, I am joined by two guys that I really respect and love as songwriters and musicians. Uh, Steve Hindelong from the choir. He's the drummer and lyricist for that band. Hi, Steve. Hey, hey. And, uh, Chris Taylor from Love Coma. And uh, he and I were just talking before we hit record for about the last half hour uh, about some connecting points he and I have back way, way back in the past back in uh, Texas and some interesting things uh, like that. But the main thing we want to talk about, the, the main reason we're together is um, to talk about song lyrics, uh, about writing lyrics, crafting lyrics, how they come about, um, you know, uh, just everything to do with that. So I don't know if you guys have any, any idea or plan of like how you want to go first or we can talk a little bit if you want in general about songwriting before we get into like reading the lyrics. So whatever, you, whatever you guys think, where you want to go. I think the master should go first, Steve. Oh, go right ahead. Please. Uh, <laughs> well, um, yeah, sure. I'll, 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 I'll go first. What the heck? Get it over with. <laughs> I just uh, ripped off the band-aid. Yeah, so um, I was thinking about, um, you know, how we're all isolated. You know, so, so much of us are. Either you're crammed in with your little family or, or like me or alone or, or whatever, you know, um, and how much relationship has to do with a, a sensual, a sensual experience. Like, like, um, particularly when you lose someone, whether it be losing a, a relationship like a divorce or, or the death of a spouse or something, um, you lose more than just the, the, the side of the, I mean, you lose the taste, the smell, the touch, the feel, everything, that all the whole sensual yeah. loss is something that you realize over time. And um, here's a, a, a lyric um, called The Color of Dreams that I wrote for Derry on his solo record. And a good friend of ours had just lost his wife to cancer. Mm. And I, I went up to his room, his bedroom on the, on the day that she had died and, and he was sitting there, his, his adult kids were down below crying and whatever. And I just went in and he was sitting on the bed and the room was just a complete mess, you know? And he says, I'm not going to watch these sheets. I can still smell Shelly on the sheets. Wow. Mm. You know, and I just thought, you know, of the sensual loss, you know? Uh, and so, this particular song, I like the idea of trying to include other senses in song lyrics because it's so easy to do the visual, you know, but right. to talk about taste and smell, to appeal to people's senses. You know, Prince was so great at that, Under the Cherry Moon or, or whatever, yeah. you know, you do things that appeal to, uh, uh, so, so this song is, is, not to get all cerebral, but it's very emotional, but the chorus, it, it talks about all five senses in the chorus. Um, but they're intangibles because he, he's lost, he's lost, the, the color of dreams is like an intangible, like you can't see, what is that, you know? Um, yeah. And so it's all, it's, it's, it's all about the loss of all those things. So I'm going to read this one. Yeah. Um, it's called the color of dreams. Um, the sun won't shine today. The car won't stop. So I'll move my left foot and then my right foot. They don't make medicine to heal this wounded heart, but I've got wine and I've got firewood. The color of dreams, the fragrance of her on the sheets, the taste of lips I'll never kiss again. The color of dreams, her warm embrace, her winter feet, the echo of her laughter on the wind. Mm. Nobody's everything to anyone, but she was mostly all I wanted. I know she's dancing now and having fun, but right now this house feels sweetly haunted. The color of dreams, the fragrance of her on the sheets, the taste of lips I'll never kiss again. The color of dreams, her warm embrace, her winter feet, the echo of her laughter on the wind, the echo of her laughter deep within. Mm. Wow. wow, man. Wow. What do you say to that? That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Wow. Yeah. That's a tough one too. Um, I mean, some, do you ever have lyrics that are so, I mean, emotional that you can't sing them? Cause I, I, 
knowing that's a real person, that's a real memory, that's an actual conversation, this is a real life that was lost. Um, I mean, sometimes, you know, it seems like it's something that would be so personal and so emotional, like, how do you, how do you get through that to bring that? Well, that's, that's one of the risks, you know, artists, songwriters, you know, we're, we're risk takers. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I often tell people, if you don't cry when you write a song, nobody's going to cry when they hear it. That's right. Yeah. You know, wow. so, uh, I do have the, the, th the thing that's unusual that Derry's uh, the singer, you know, I don't most often sing. Um, and so there's that kind of freedom to just some, even stuff that's really revelatory and personal by myself that I might not say, I can say it and it comes through him, his, his voice, you know, and I, I, uh, and also Derry has a very tender kind of a sweet voice, you would say maybe, yeah. right? A really sweet tone. And so I could write really kind of edgy things and they like, like, um, Dig the dog a grave in the garden, you know, really extreme yeah. things where it's not dig the dog a grave. It's like the sweet voice singing it. You oh, know? yeah. It all sounds Great. like a love song. when yeah. right? sings it. <laughs> I can say some outrageous. If you look at it, sometimes I'll say some things that are pretty, you know, outrageous in sexual innuendo or whatever. I can get away with it because of that. But yeah. The medicine, so it's, it's, a, it's the sugar, the a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that is so true. Yeah. Yeah, so let me ask you this. So as a songwriter, knowing you're gonna sort of give this lyric to another singer to sing, how much do you share with them of your personal experience with the song? And how much do you just kind of let them take it, interpret it and run with it uh, without knowing we don't talk yeah, especially about like, it. especially like the song that you just yeah. shared with us. It's, right. It's, no, we don't talk about it. Uh, Derry doesn't say anything. Almost nothing. Very rarely does he say one word. He just sings yeah. it. Uh, you know Derry, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, he doesn't know. Uh, but once in a while, he'll say if he doesn't like something, but I can't even remember. It's so rare I could count that on three fingers. Um, and he knows what they're about. You know, we're so, we are like, brothers you know and so a lot of times i try i know he's had so many of the same experiences um but um no we just don't we just don't talk about it and the other yeah. thing is that people don't have the benefit when they hear it of an explanation right. rarely i mean yeah. like now these rare opportunities like this where i could say what the song's about but most people they hear it and they're applying it to their own their own loss, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, they, it's yeah. not important that they know that it was my friend Leo and his wife Shelly. Their loss could have been, you know, not the death of a spouse, but another kind of uh, human loss. They could have lost a child or, yes. or, their, or their kid could be gone off to college sure. and they're feeling that the loss. Yeah. You know, so, exactly. so there's no reason, yeah. you know, there's no reason, you know, we, yeah, the explanations don't, you know. I suppose like you as a painter, that must be all the more that way because you, there's inspiration that led to whatever you're doing. Well, you put on that canvas and then somebody takes it and you don't even know they're hanging it where? Are they hanging it in the bathroom, in the hallway? Or did they just set it in their garage and gave you the $75 because they knew you needed it? You know? Yeah. Right? It's an offering. It's up to the wind. <laughs> That's so true. Right? And, you know, and to me, I love that. I love that. Not that, that your you paintings are or 75. I know your paintings get a lot more than $75. <laughs> not, not that much more, but you know, <laughs> yeah. let's see what the future holds. Um, you know, I know I love that because it also, to me, it adds that, um, I don't know what, what the word is for it, but for lack of a better term, it adds like a really cool um, wonder and mystery because you write the tune and Derry sings it and somehow when it's all said and done and you give it to us in the form of an album or a single and we get to listen to it there's that magical uh <laughs> i was about ready to say the magical mystery and i'm like oh i'm going to <laughs> no, mystery edit, edit. Yeah. But, there, but there is something very magical about like when i listen to shadow weaver or when i'm or when i'm like the other day I, I, we had a I have a choir set list that starts with clouds and turns into cross that river and goes mm -hmm. into like it has like four hours of your music on there and, and, and sort of I, I displayed it in my own my mood if I'm in a mood I, I have a set list to order that I want to hear it like that and so those songs 
I know for me have my my own meaning. Uh, and I and I almost don't want to know what some of them are about because I'm like I you know mm -hmm. it's just like I love the I, I love what I what I love the way the way I feel when it when it comes on it's like seeing a music video mm -hmm. sometimes you uh, like especially back in the eighties you you love this tune and all of a sudden you see the video and it like scars you for life you can't help but see those images you know in your mind um, but yeah I think that's beautiful um, uh, I think it's a, a perfect um, artistic relationship you and Derry from you know all throughout your your music I think it's perfect so yeah love it Thanks. I wonder sometimes Steve um, so you, you're talking about the side of it that the, the benefit of you know you get to write the lyric but you know kind of Derry has to be the one to stand up there and, and deliver it but do you ever because like I don't have I don't relate to that I, I, I am a songwriter and when I'm writing a lyric I'm thinking I can't wait to sing this. And so do you ever write something where you think, man, I wish I could sing that? Oh yeah, all the time. But every drummer thinks that, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a nightmare. Every band, drummer picks up a guitar and like, oh no, oh no. Yeah. I'm like the bane. <laughs> I've been that guy, you know. I, I produce a lot of bands and I, I see the drummer doing that. And I'm like, I know, they, yeah. they, they hate me too, my friend. <laughs> oh my gosh. A lot of times I do think, um, you know, I did a solo record or two, a couple, you know, and it's yeah. fun to do that, but I, I realized I don't have that. I have a character voice, you know, and, and I like the fact that every time that I think that, I think I sound pretty good on this song. I wonder if they're going to ask me if I should sing it. And then when Derry finally does sing it, we're done with it. I'm so glad that he did. Right. That wasn't me, you know? <laughs> uh, so, yeah. but yeah, of course I have those, those feelings and ego and that, Sure. Drummer, drummer, you know, why, why, why does a person become a drummer in the first place? You know, they're hitting a bang and a drum. It's like attention getting behavior. It's role. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we have to grow, grow beyond that. It's a lifetime of growing up, getting over that. We call our, what do we sit on? We call it a throne, a drum throne. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> oh, I love that. As drummers, we wrestle with our egos, you know. Right. <laughs> We're playing the loudest instrument, but we're sitting in the back. I'm sitting back behind, behind Terry Taylor. He's got me all blocked, you know, with this music stand here on the wall. I love it. Right? Oh, beautiful. Oh, wow. oh, man. Well, Chris, you got something for us? Someone you want to share? Okay. Um, I, I put out a record uh, called Lovers, Thieves, Fools, and Pretenders. And... Um, and here's a song on it. Um, it's a song called Glory Hallelujah. And I, I had been in this uh, seven years of um, like, where I couldn't forgive myself for things that I've done. And, and I was in this sort of deep uh, black hole of oblivion in my spirit, in my mind. It was not, it was not a healthy place, but I'd spent seven years just sort of slowly clawing my way uh, out of that hole. And I sort of came out of it with this, with this batch of songs. And um, I wrote a song called Glory Hallelujah, partly because it's the most um, obvious sort of uh, religious cliche type song. But the song is really about um, self-hatred and it's almost written from the perspective of, at least most of the song is kind of written from the perspective of sort of the enemy whispering in your ear. Mm. And, uh, <clears throat> and I was really into, like, I'm into Nina Simone and she has like some really great sort of call and response songs. And this song is one of those where it's like a mixture of of like what I was going for anyway is like this sort of Nina Simone meets Leonard Cohen where he, where there's these majestic uh, women singing the background vocals and he's just sort of uh, singing over the top of them. But so in that setting is where this comes to you and uh, it's called Glory Hallelujah. And it goes something like this. <clears throat> I've hated you for too long. I needed some momentum. I'm in the heaviest low, I've got nowhere to go. Don't try to jump out the window. You got to shake yourself awake. Death is on the telephone pretending he's a rattlesnake. And there's a shimmer on your skin, but my faith is wearing thin. 
I'm finally standing still, but it's all against my will. Does it fill you up with fear? Are you seeing things clear? Faithful heart, unfaithful mind. You seek forever, never find. Put your mind to it, lover, even if you can't recover. We're all just crawling through the dust, looking for someone to trust. Out of sight is out of mind, but out of mind is out of sight. Your name became a curse in my zero universe. And there's a man on the corner looking like he's down and drunk. Now he's turning up his radio. Here comes the sound of stoner funk. Yeah, he's turning up his radio. Here comes that sound. Here comes that sound. You got to shield yourself from a world of pain, singing glory, hallelujah. Shield yourself from a world of pain, singing glory, hallelujah. Mm. Wow. Dear, that's see, what I want to do, I want to see that lyric, and I want to underline every verb. Because that's a sign of good writing is like, I, I would tell that to when I'm writing with a young near sister, whatever. It's like, forget about the adjectives. I mean, that's fine. But, but all your description, every line is like got something is happening yeah you're feeling i'm just feeling i want to i'm i'm i want to go back and read it um, again immediately yeah. oh cool you know it's just uh, from right to the end shield you know shield like you're doing everything is a demonstration and it's so uh emotive mm -hmm. spectacular I thank can't you thank what, you you got a tune for it yeah um you can it's it's out streaming it's out in the world right now uh, Glory, hallelujah! It's on a record called "Lovers, Thieves, Fools, and Pretenders," and um, yeah, man. Um, okay, you said that. Yeah, I, I, I just I love the line about the rattlesnake. I love just how that. I love those unexpected lines. You know what I mean? Like, there's all these typical things you expect. Like, okay, I hear I hear the first the, the first uh, line. I know you're going to be rhyming that word, and I'm and I'm expecting it. But then when I hear rattlesnake is like, is the rhyme, it's like, oh, well, I wouldn't have pulled that out. I, I wasn't expecting that. That's great. And then I love the thing that you flip out of sight is out of mind and out of mind is out of sight. That was, it's, ah. just, it's just flipping it, but by flipping it, it is two different things. And it, and it's a continuation of this thought I thought was awesome. I want to hear it again. I really do. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> seriously. I also, I I'm, I'm, we're working on a new album too. And so I'm everything that anyone says could end up in a song. And like, you yeah, go for it. Please put this to music. I have no problem. No, no, no. When you were, I wouldn't steal your lyrics, but I, but <laughs> your commentary in between songs is up for grabs. So yeah, what, yeah. You said, what you said before you were introducing it, you basically said, I spent seven years clawing my way out of a black hole of oblivion. Mm. I wrote that down. And yeah. You said that in three different parts, but I'm like, wow, I spent seven years clawing my way out of a black hole of oblivion. Well, I don't know if this is, if it's like this for you and, um, gosh, this is, this is a much longer thing. I don't want to get into the whole deal right now because it'll take, it's, it's, it's a very long conversation and probably not, not meant to be shared in any kind of social media, but just for me personally, uh, for, for me personally, it's like when, like I'm easy to forgive somebody else. Like if somebody does something to me, whether on purpose or inadvertently, like I can kind of go, all right, whatever. I might not ever be their friend, or I, but I can kind of get past it. But when I do something to kind of sabotage myself, yeah, like it's this weight on me that I cannot shake off for whatever reason. And it, and it stays with me a really long time. So uh, this record and these songs were born out of one of those experiences where it's like born out of self-sabotage. And then, you know, I threw myself down this hole and I couldn't figure out how to climb out of it for like years. I couldn't figure it. I couldn't, I couldn't even figure out like how to like laugh like a normal person and just, cause I, I used to be super lighthearted and fun and, and I'd like to think that was fun to be around. And then I knew I sensed within myself something, I like lost that person, I lost that part of me. And so, and then I also had this, I don't even wanna call it a crisis of faith, cause I don't, even, I don't even think that, it's not even about that. I just decided like, when you stare into that, that, when you stare into the face of nothingness and you say to yourself, well maybe, 
you know, maybe everything I was ever told to believe by another man or another woman or another person, uh, maybe none of that is real. Maybe I've just been brainwashed to think, you know, X, Y, Z, whatever it is. And so for me, I, I went right up to the edge of that thinking and I stared at oblivion. Like I thought, what if there is nothing? Yeah. What if everything I've been told are, is just stories handed down from one person to the next? And I, and, I, and I dealt with all the things that I was so afraid to deal with because I wanted, I wanted to consider myself a believer. I wanted to consider myself um, someone who's passionate and living daily in, my, in a faith, you know? And then through this act of self-sabotage, I went, if I'm capable of this, holy crap, like what in the... Like, I wouldn't have written that in the book of my life, I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, I began to question everything about me. And I was able to go right up to the edge and say, like, what if there's nothing? Am I okay with that? Am I okay if there's nothing? And I had to deal with those sort of really intense, dark questions. And I had to come to a... I had to come to a resting place in my spirit to where I'm like, you know what? I'm okay. I'm okay with it because I'm just a, I'm just a speck of dust. I'm a grain. It's like all my knowledge, everything, everything that I've compiled in my little 50 year old brain, like I don't really know anything. Yeah. So I'm okay with not knowing. Yeah. I'm okay with it. And the minute I realized that I was able to, I was free. I felt like I was free for the first time in years. And so that's when all these songs just sort of came pouring out. Wow. So yeah, it's, but I haven't really talked about that with anybody. That's sort of like breaking news yeah. for nobody. <laughs> breaking news for no one <laughs> yeah, at I gotta, 11. <laughs> I got to get this album tonight and listen to this. Lovers, Thieves, Fools, and Pretenders. Yes. I got to get that. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people, a lot of people struggle um, like I, I deal a lot with people um, who have gone through, we call it, it's called deconstruction of your faith. Or basically it's questioning your faith, like you're saying, questioning the status quo of Christianity that you were born into, you know, well, Pastor Bob and my Sunday school teacher and my parents have all told me X, Y, Z, but then you start seeing that maybe, maybe a hundred percent of that isn't exactly right. Maybe it isn't this, it's something else. Um, right. And then that's a scary place. For a lot of people to be, um, and many many times I've seen well, uh, and like you're saying, I went through uh, my own deconstruction process. Um, it's been going on for about 15 years now, um, but I had a, I could deal with all of the sort of theological things I was questioning. But I came like you're saying to the edge of something for the first time. Like I I came right. I feel like I came right up to the edge of losing everything, like you're saying, like just letting go of like, I don't think, like everything I thought I believed about God and all that, like I, I was just about to lose everything. And my wife, Wendy, <laughs> such a gift to me because I, I always process everything verbally. And I was reading this book, what was happening. And I, I was like, oh my gosh. And I, I said, Wendy, check this out. I read this to her. And the implications of it were like really kind of scaring the crap out of me. Like, if this is true, then maybe I can't believe anything. And she really pulled me back. Like the, the one thing, all she really said to me was, um, she says, you know, Keith, everything you've deconstructed, everything you've questioned, everything you've doubted, everything you've reconsidered and rethought, um, it's always drawn you actually nearer to Jesus. It's more about like pulling away crap and cobwebs and junk that sort of people have put in the way between like religion and theology and stuff. It's like pulling all that crap away just to kind of get at who Jesus is. Um, and yet this one thing that was threatening to push me off the edge was actually not doing that. It wasn't something that was removing garbage that made it, that draw, drew me nearer to Jesus. It was actually something that was sort of cutting me off. Um, and then just even that simple realization was enough to make me kind of take a step back and go, oh, I don't have to believe this. <laughs> I, I don't have to go where this is taking me, right? I have a choice to decide I can back up and think about this from an, another angle. But those are scary moments, right? When you feel like you're about to lose everything and you don't know what you believe in anymore and, and you feel like you've lost that foundation, that's a scary place. It, it's scary, uh, 
but it's also there's some liberation in it too. Mm -hmm. Oh, totally. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah, I I 100% agree with that. It's it's only scary because it you're used to being one way and now you're not that way anymore. Yeah. But when you walk through it and you make decisions for yourself, not based upon what somebody else wants you to, to, to say or to think, um, then for, in my case anyway, just something really special happened. Like I was able to kind of discover who, who I really am and, and ultimately what it boils down to is that, so you go, okay, if there is a God and that God is love, yes. then, then that, that love is going to encompass me no matter what I, I end up believing. Because what I end up believing is only going to be for a short time anyway. Right. You know, it's like it, it has nothing to, like, and that love who created me knew I was gonna go through this time way back when I was being formed in my mother's womb. So it's like, this is not a surprise to love, you know? It's not a surprise. And it's only a surprise to me because I'm having to live it. Yeah. So there is a freedom in that. And there's a, the greatest freedom I have is all of a sudden not really caring what other people think yeah. about me, you know? And as a person who goes up on stage and writes lyrics and tries to, write music that people that I want people to like all of a sudden I go oh I just want to write music that I like and I want to just do things that make me feel alive mm -hmm. and I want to write the truth of who I am and that's what I've always wanted to do but now I feel like I'm finally doing it without uh, yeah. any disclaimers or any like anybody prohibiting me from doing yeah. that so I'm not writing for a market or a denomination or a theology or yeah you're just like perfect. and that's a huge temptation right that's on many levels, right? We want to fit in. We want to. We don't want to be labeled something, you know. Yeah, write the write the music you want to hear, paint the painting you want to see, dance the way you want to dance. You know, it's like yeah, that's that's. Uh, and it is it is challenging because you do feel those expectations mm -hmm. uh, commercially. You know, do you do you paint for the? You know what I mean? We at some yeah. point. Um, uh, and you do feel the expectations of people, but it's like, we always say, let's just, let's just make the record we want to hear. Right. Yeah. You know, and I'm so proud of you guys because when you make a record you want to hear, I freaking want to hear that record too. You know, like I, I love it. We yeah. bought this cheesy little suitcase turntable the other day and we listened to Shadow Weaver on it and it sounds and all of the cheesiness of the record player, it sounds so glorious. It was like to have morning coffee with Shadow Weaver is, oh, is amazing. Shadow Weaver, that's really cool of you, thank you. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, I love that. And, and just like I said, all the music you like, and I turn my wife on to restore my soul and she cannot stop listening. Like she listens to that song as if it just came out yeah. like two days ago and is, and we listen to it loud. So we have it in the house loud. So your drums are booming in the house. Yeah. 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 Well, I gotta say too, like along those lines, that Circle Slide album. So I have two boys that are now in their twenties and I feel like I've raised them right because like they, they both love, you know, The Verve and um, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, London Suede. And, you know, like, I feel like I've, I've done a good job at least as far as musically passing on good music to them but i let um i let my my boys listen to circle slide and my youngest son was like this album came out like years before urban hymns and it's like it's it's even better it's so great like he just was <laughs> geeking out over how freaking amazing circle slide was and he couldn't believe it came out before he was born you know like it's such a great record nice urban hymns is a great record oh no i did yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, that's high compliment. That's high praise. Tell them thanks for that. But you know, it hasn't date. It, it's not. Yeah, you know, it, it's like what all great music. I think is like to me. Circle Slide is a great example of that. Like that, that album is not dated. Like it doesn't feel like a '90s record. You know what I mean? Mm. It feels like it could come out today. It's just a really simple. I think it's the production is like really simple. Like the and the lyrics and the music are just so sublime. I don't know. It's just a great record, man. Well, Steve, one of the things I love about your writing, I like there's a lot of things I like about it, but something very specific is that you include a lot of, um, it almost sounds like 
like an intimate conversational type lyrics to where I feel like I'm eavesdropping in on a conversation between you and somebody else and I don't know all the specifics. And you're saying, you're saying like very pure, uh, I wish I could, I wish I had your lyrics in front of me right now. Cause I could, prior to this, I could probably name about five of them, but now I'm like, I'm on the spot and I'm bringing it up and I'm going, ah, but it feels like I'm in, I'm listening to something where I'm going, I don't know all the details of this, but I'm listening to something very pure and private or, or like something that happened in your life that only you witnessed, uh, you know, and I'm, but all of a sudden I'm like, oh, but when you set to music, it leaves room just enough to me, like, like you said, for me to paint my own picture in my head of what that means to me. And I think that's a really cool, um, I don't even wanna say a technique, but it's just a really cool thing that you do that, like I'm not, like you know, you have, you have some songwriters uh, who are really great storytellers and it has a beginning and a middle and an end and you, you know, and it takes you on this little journey. And then there's like a guy like, myself where I just I come up with like a couple of couplets or a couple of things here and there and then I you know a couple of weeks later I put, mash them all together and it's like this is the song you know um but anyways so yeah I find that really fascinating that you do that I don't even know if you know that you do that but I love that about your songwriting thanks well yeah uh, I always have said that most of my songs are to one person that's why we, we did sort of a best, best of retrospective. We called it Love, Songs, and Prayers. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Even a prayer is to one person. You restore my soul. It's specifically, I'm not telling anyone else what to do with their faith or anything, <laughs> but it's a prayer. Um, and the same thing with the intimate love songs. You're kind of in on this private thing, like you're not even supposed to be there. Um, I got that, I think, from my earliest influences, because I'm, you know, I, I came up in the 70s. I'm 10 years older than you and so Chris and uh, uh, it was Joni Mitchell and James Taylor and Neil Young. And they just told yeah. that they made it out the last time I saw Richard or, or Sarah Maria is my daughter or whatever. It was so uh, he's James Taylor's going, the junkie's sick, the monkey's strong. That's what's wrong. He's talking about his heroin addiction. I'm 16 years old and he's already telling the, the truth. These people are Neil Young. You know, I was thinking about what a friend had said. I was hoping it was a lie. And I'm thinking, gosh, I, I would like to ask him what his friend said. And who was that yeah. friend? Yeah. You know, you're let in on this, tr and, you, and it gives you a sense of truth, that you're telling me the truth. Yeah. I'm telling you something. I'm just letting you overhear something that is true. Yeah. And the details are, are you know, that you put the very specific details in there. Uh, and the more details are, the more original mm. it is. That's the truth. Yeah, that is so true. It's such a simple idea, and so few songwriters do that, in, that I can tell. You do that very well, and I'm grateful for that. Because you marry that with the kind of sonic palette that you guys have, and it turns something simple and pure into something psychedelic, <laughs> which is really great, too. So you add this sort of trippy psychedelic in some of your songs with this purity, and then also the pu the same that the purity in your lyric writing matches the same purity in Derry's voice to me. So it's like yeah. this perfect marriage with like a drop of LSD or something, in there, which is <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Let me ask you a question, uh, Chris, about the writing. Do you find because you pretty much write alone, right? I mean, you you correct, yeah, yourself. And so, but I find I that it's more important for the for the lyric to serve the song than the other way around. Like it makes for a better song. The melody is the number one thing I always say. And so when I write a lyric, if, if I write before the music, which most of the case I don't, I wait for chord progression or something come in my way and respond to it. So the melody is first and then I shape craft the lyric. For instance, when you, when you write lyrics by your, without a music, it tends to be a lot of syllables, a lot of words. Yes. And then you go to cram it onto a song. Sometimes it's forced on, it's contrived. You wouldn't, do that if you had a song like, okay, come on, let's ride the circle slide. Come on, let's yeah. ride, ride the circle slide. Now, who would write that? Here's the chorus. Other than the fact the guitar was there first. Now, 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 now. Derry already has the guitar hook. That's first. Yeah. So I'm answering it. 
now, 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 come on, let's ride. Now, 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 yeah. circle, slide. You know, the, the, the lyric serves the melody and I'm able to do, and the other thing is that I'm not precious. If I write lyrics and then I hear the tune it needs to land on, I'll completely rewrite it. Maybe it's some line in the third verse that go, oh, that's the chorus, you know. Right. Not, yeah. I readapt, I'll completely readapt it, scrap it. Sometimes I'll even have music to a tune that I wrote and I'll hear this other tune of Darius and I'm like, forget what I wrote. I'm going to readapt it, restructure it, craft. I mean, yeah. songwriting is, lyric, lyric writing is different than poetry in that way that, that you're crafting the lyric for the music. Mm -hmm. So what do you find that as a writer, like how do you, what's your process? Music, is it simultaneous, lyric before, or, you know? Um, well, it's changed over the years, mainly out of sheer boredom, because I'm a guy that just picks up an acoustic guitar and plays chords. I don't even, it's even, I hear melodies in my head, but I can't really play them on the guitar. Right. So I usually have somebody else much better than me to come in and play those melodies or come up with their own. So over the years, I, I've gotten bored of reaching for a guitar. So what I've done is I've spent, um, hours and hours going, I'm going to start with drum loops. I'm going to, I'm going to create drum patterns and that will ignite my imagination and go, I would have never come up with this if the drum hadn't sounded like this first. Yeah. Or, um, starting, okay. So starting lovers, thieves, fools, and pretenders, this record, I, I had a, I would just like have a drum loop, and then I would hold down like a D minor chord on this sort of on a synthesizer that had like this really uh, sonic vibe to it. The status like, of all keys. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> and uh, my poor friend Val, who plays pedal steel, I had him come over and I'd say, okay, I know this is gonna be crazy, but I have like a seven minute D minor thing could you just play pedal steel and I'm going to try to, I'm going to be your conductor. So I'd stand in the room and I'd be like, okay, uh, mainly just drones. We're going to run through like a, a like a, an echo pedal. And I want kind of drones here. And then at the, like the four minute mark, I want you to kind of get like real psychotic with the pedal steel. And I'm having him filter that through his, like whatever he feels is well, psychotic well, pedal steel. <laughs> so anyway, long story longer. Um, I would have like six or seven of these, these pieces of music, which felt like you should probably take a minute and a half of this and put it in a movie somewhere during a scary, like a, a scene in a movie or a tense, a thriller or something. And so I felt like I was making a soundtrack to a movie that was not released or not available. Mm -hmm. And then um, I would just sit with it and sit with it. And I would, I would come downstairs, uh, make coffee, and I'd sing through my bullet harmonica mic and I would, I wouldn't even write lyrics. I would just, I would just, I would emote to whatever the music made me feel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, through the process of that, I realized, cause I was, uh, I was coming out of this depression. And so I didn't really have anything to write. I couldn't even focus to write. I was just, uh, it just all seemed pointless to me. So I would just be singing this, mush until something happened and I was singing words that I felt like I don't know if I would ever say this and then I realized oh these are the lies that the enemy has been telling me for the last you know however many years mm. oh I'm gonna write those lies down I'm gonna write those down there you go. and then I would uh, I have a song called April Moon and it starts off the record and it's and it's all it is is the enemy whispering in my ear and uh and it's like this I would never have written that way. I would have never decided, oh, I'm going to make this kind of a thing. But I, I didn't think anybody was even going to hear this. I thought this was just therapy because I didn't go to a therapist and I didn't go to church and I was just like sitting here. And so my idea was like, all right, how do I heal myself? Well, I'm going to create. That's how I heal is to yeah. create. And so that was, that's the process. But, you know, there have been many times when, when uh, even back when, we first started to kind of talk to each other and get to know each other. I was, I was um, so, my head was so filled with trying to impress an A&R guy or, and I don't even know how to do that. Even today, I would not know how to do any of that stuff. But 
my mind was elsewhere. And so I was just writing words uh, and I, I couldn't even tell you what they were really all about or what they really stood for. I was just sort of like, ah, I just want to get it out and be in a rock and roll band. Mm -hmm. And now I'm like, all I want to do is write something that makes me feel alive. And mm -hmm. then uh, the rest, you know, let the chips fall where, where they may kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I got to say, Steve, I, um, I'm shocked to hear you say that, that you, you write to the music mainly. Cause when I read your lyrics, it, I, I would swear that you must have sat down and wrote those lyrics out, you know, completely as they were, uh, you know what I mean? Like, uh, almost never, almost never that. That's, it's, I, my, I have more respect for you now than I've ever had because like when I, when I've done, like, when I sit down to write, I'm going to write a song, right? I'm going to write the lyrics and I'm going to try to write something that I think is really cool. I would write something probably like you, like I see you writing. But when I've done the thing, like what Chris is talking about, where, you know, like, well, here's some cool music and I'm just kind of stream of consciousness, just kind of like, you know, uh, kind of blah, blah, blah for a bit. And, oh, oh, I got a line here. And, oh, okay, here you go. And then I kind of throw it together. And I like what I get when I do that, but I never, ever get something as cool as I would if I were to sit down and think about it and write it all out. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. It's amazing to me that you, if you could do it like that and come up, like you're getting the result that I, I can only get if I sit down and try to write a song, you know, lyrically. You know, everybody's process is different and we all, songs get real, written so many different ways. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah, it's it. And especially co-writing was challenging because you're, then you're dealing with another person and their, and their whole thing. And it's most of the time it doesn't work out. Most co-writing meetups, you know, you, you hang out for a few hours and get somewhere, but it doesn't really happen. You know, those, those connections, when you find that, that rapport with someone, yeah. uh, I had it with Mark Bird and, and several people. Uh, that's a whole nother thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's not a science. You know, is it? I mean, that's why I have so much more respect for the traveling Wilburys. Can you imagine being in that band <laughs> and throwing out song lyric ideas and having Bob Dylan or George Harrison shoot them down? And you're like, yeah. you know, like it's, it's, to me, I, I I have a lot of respect for that band just because I'm like, wow, they 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 came together and laid down their collective egos to make something yeah. uh, that sounds like it's a, it was a blast to be a part of. But yeah, that's it's so like Tom Petty lyrics to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I bet he had a lot to do with it. I don't know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've always wanted to co-write more with people, but I, I never really figured out how to, how to ask without it seeming like, cause it's, it's weird. And I don't know if, Steve, you're in Nashville and it might be, it might have always been this way where you're kind of um, around the scene more, but it feels like the more songwriters I get to know, especially even younger songwriters who are in it to like, I want to co-write and I want to, uh, they want it to be like official, you know, uh, what is it, R write a word, get a third kind of a thing or whatever, whatever those kind of. I've got a whole bunch of those. Okay, write a word, get a third, write a chord, get ignored. <laughs> play, the, play the drums you're a bum because remember you just oh wrote, wrote a song because of the beat a lot of times a drummer plays a beat it becomes a song play the bass pie in the face <laughs> oh my gosh i yeah. got a whole bunch of them yeah yeah <laughs> but i feel like i've never i've written i've co-written with people but what i would do is i just send them they'd ask me for lyrics and i would just send them like several pages of lyrics and i would just say edit to your heart's delight like Right. Or if you like part of a line and it, and it ignites your imagination and you want to finish it with your thing, like, like nothing is sacred. I'm not precious about it. I'm giving these to you, use them. But we've never been like, I've never sat in the same room with, with another person and said, okay, where, where do we go from here? Where, how, how shall we begin? You know? Right. It's yeah. You either have the chemistry or you don't. Like I've only found, you know, JJ and I were in that band for five years and JJ and I found a chemistry together that I, we, we, you know, we could trust each other to do our part of it. And that was pretty consistent. And then I had this other friend of mine, John Warmond, where we didn't co-write, like sit down in the room with the guitar and the, and the, you know, the, the pad, the pad and paper together and write songs together. But I, it, it was where I would write the lyrics 
and I would give them to him. And the next, but, but when I, but when he came back to me with music, it was always like, oh my gosh, in a million years, if, if I could have, if I could have written music, it would have been like this, or even, you know, not even this good. It's like, it's better than I would have ever thought. Like, that's rare. If you find a, a writing partner that you kind of click with, you know, and, and everything kind of gels like that. That's rare. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, and it's hard to find a writing partner too, when you're like, yeah, I'm just going to play D minor for seven minutes. <laughs> right. Well, I just try you know? to write something. Yeah, keep going. And, keep I, and I want to write a song about hating yourself. Let's go. You know, it's like, oh, yeah. Right, great. Well, do you guys, what do you guys want to share into some more lyrics while uh, we got some time left here? I want to hear a couple more. Weren't you going to say something? Weren't you going to get ready to read one, Keith? Uh, I can read one. I just, you know, it's been a long time since I've written anything. The, I did this album um, uh, years ago um, under the name Elysian Skies. I'll, I'll, I'll just read one of them. Um, so this song is called Faded Chameleons. Um, Faded this is the chameleons. flesh that makes your spirit weep. I took the blame when it wasn't mine to keep. The one you created is falling apart. The one that you love just keeps breaking your heart. In the chorus, with pencil and paper and wire and string, all of us tangled and dying to breathe. Copy and silence and letters from home. I know I don't have the strength to be alone. Uh, and then the second chorus, second verse, um, the shadow will never return to the flame, and I am forever reminded of shame. Like faded chameleons, tired of change, resigned to conform to, to the color of gray. And in the bridge, uh, one day to suffer my final disgrace, one day to enter and rise from the grave, one day to melt in your holy embrace. I was the servant who was not enslaved. Mm. So, yeah, the, the bulk of, I mean, the, the sort of the crux of that song I wrote when I first moved to California, um, graduated high school, I mean, sorry, graduated from college, went to work at DMIT Music Group in California. I didn't know anybody. My wife, Wendy, stayed behind for three months to finish college. She was still finishing her degree. So for three months, I didn't know a single human being. Um, I was absolutely alone for the first time in my life. And I'm an only child. I always thought, oh, you know, I like being alone. I'm an introvert. I love that. Um, but oh my gosh, after just a couple of weeks, man, I was dying inside. And that line, you know, uh, coffee and silence and letters from home. I know I don't have the strength to be alone. It was like a major revelation for me that I needed other human beings, <laughs> that I was not this island uh, who didn't need people, you know, and it was, it was the loneliest, most painful time of my life. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, that probably that line is the, the first line that kind of kicked off that song. Uh, and then the line about faded chameleons, like I always um, spent a long time beating myself up over sort of the Christian I was expected to be versus the Christian I really was, you know, um, feeling like, well, you know, if you were really, if you were really a good Christian, you would, you would witness more or you would whatever, you know, like I'm, these re expectations that were put on me by other people that it took me a long time to get out from under that and recognize that, you know, those weren't things that I should ever allow anyone to put on me. Um, kind of get over that, forgive myself for that, and kind of just say it, be who I am and be okay with that. So. It struck me that the, the, your lyric, it was pretty grim. <laughs> most, most of the way I was just thinking, oh man. And then when I got to the, the, the ultimate, pain you know the chameleon that it result resigned itself to be gray or whatever how, yeah. how did you word that the chameleon yeah like faded chameleons tired of change resigned to conform to the color of gray yeah, yeah the conform it's just like this is down this is a down and then the very end you turned it you came up with hope at the last minute had to yeah i had to that's what i kind of take away was like well i think he was more longer in the pain and then yeah, I don't know, you know. Yeah, no, there that that bridge, that bridge had to be there. That because that's the part, you know, one day to suffer my final disgrace, one day to enter and rise from the grave, one day to melt in your holy embrace. I was the servant who was not enslaved. And so it really is sort of this redemptive release and freedom. Um and, and it kind of helped me to like get free of it now. Like I don't have to wait till I'm dead. <laughs> 
to, to experience that. Like if I can know right now that I'm going to experience that, why wait? I can just do that now. I can experience that freedom from all that crap right now. So, Right. So, yeah. And the irony is actually the music to that on the song, on the record is super happy. <laughs> it's this really kind of a Django uh, pop kind of song. It's, it's kind of upbeat and the lyrics go a completely different direction. I so love it. The lyrics, it's like, he's not singing anything happy. This is actually no, really dark. That tension works really well. It, it's a classic style, you know, like Johnny Cash, like, uh, first time that I shot her, I shot her in the side. <laughs> and, and, and Delia died, Delia, you know. Oh, Delia. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Happy. Well, well, let me ask you guys this. This is, this is an interesting thought about the idea of turning a song around to add some, have some sort of redemptive thing. Because a lot of times, like I always think of making albums to where I'm like, I'm super old school, even though I know people just, you know, click and listen to 30 seconds and then ah, next and then they, I get that. But I don't write for that anyway. I just never will. So, so to me, I'm like, I don't know if I want to tell the whole St the redemption story in every song, mm -hmm. especially if, you know, like, you know, and again, it just it boils down to why people write songs in the first place. But there's some songs where I'm like, yeah, this is a bleak outlook or this is um, whatever, whatever it is, actually. And I think but if you listen to it as a whole, you know, or should, I should say you listen to the album as a whole, then all of a sudden you feel like, oh, there's the journey. That was just that was just track three, but oh, on track five, yeah, you know, whatever the case may be, there's the redemption, you know, there's the redemption, or it might not be, you know, until the very end of the record. Like Lovers Thieves, to me, I don't want to call it a downer of a record because it's definitely not, but there really isn't any sort of redemption until uh, the very last song is called Lay It On Me, and that's sort of the sort of the bright shining like sigh of relief after after the long journey you know but yeah so that was i'd like to get your take on that of whether or not like man you feel like you have to put something in there um because you're worried about other like what other people are going to think right when it's all said and done yeah yeah well yeah i feel that i feel the weight of that expectation yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah yeah, I, I like. I like. Oh, go ahead. Record, I, I just say I, I like thinking of the record uh, when you think of it as a as a as an album. Like you think of like writing a record. Like because I mean, when I was writing that, I just thought I'm writing a song, and then later on, it got put into a record, right? So, um, but the idea of treating it like almost like a Pilgrim's Progress, or like you said, a journey, right? Okay, so at the beginning, we're gonna go here, and then I'm gonna take you there, and then track three is gonna take you to this other place, and then we're gonna turn the corner and go here, um, and then the entire record sort of um, land somewhere, you know? I like that. That's really cool. That's just a different way of thinking of it. I've never thought of it that way because I haven't made enough records. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe, maybe we, all, we should just put like one track, make, like put all songs to where it's just only one track. So you hear all 12 songs, but it's just track one. <laughs> so that way people just are forced to listen to the whole thing. Like, uh, this is still track one? Right. You know, that's what David Lynch did with Mulholland Drive. If you watch the film Mulholland Drive, there are no chapters. You cannot advance chapters. If you do, you jump to the final end credits of the film. You have to watch the entire thing and you cannot skip. Oh, wow. That's a good idea. There you go. Yeah, that's brilliant. <laughs> what you got, Steve? Do you have anything else? An oh. Another lyric? Well, I'm just bouncing around. I got my iPhone here and I'm bouncing around, you know, uh -huh. it might be like, figure, what am I gonna... based on what you guys have said, I, my mind's jumping. But since you wrote, uh, read that, Keith, um, and we're talking about, I think that when it comes to uh, redemption or, uh, or restoration with, with, with God, with divinity, I think that is immediate. And a lot of times I think we feel like this, oh, I'm so, I've fallen away or I'm so bad off that it's going to take a lot of work to get back. Whereas you, you just have the message of the prodigal son, you know, mm -hmm. it's like it's really immediate forgiveness uh, with God is immediate. Yeah, just it's not like, you know, uh, as opposed to other relationships. 
and other things like let's say I'm really out of shape and I'm, I got to like get back in shape, but, uh, but I haven't worked out in, you know, two years. So what's the use kind of thing uh, or I don't know examples, but this song um, is that very thing. It's like I was in a pretty, I wrecked my life pretty good at this point. And um, that whole Circle Slide album, in fact, is like a, a real album about that redemption. Um, but so this song is kind of about that. It's like it's, it's, it's uh, I don't know, it speaks for itself, but I'm reading it because Chris said his, his wife likes it a lot. Uh, I call to you with one lung exploded from breathing the dust of the earth, with my tongue eroded from licking the crust of the earth, a tear away from reconciled, a prayer away from whole, restore my soul. I cry to you with two eardrums blistered from laughing with preachers of night, with my vertebrae twisted from dancing with creatures of night, a day away from sanctified, a breath away from whole, restore my soul. I crawl to you with tin fingers smoking from turning the pages of sin, with my spirit choking from earning the wages of sin, a bridge away from justified, a step away from whole, restore my soul. Mm. I love that lyric. That's why you're the master, man. That's such a great, Ah, oh, great, great lyric. I just love the fact that you use the word vertebrae. In that <laughs> song. <laughs> like, how many rock and roll songs have the word vertebrae? Yes. Oh, no. Maybe you should go that's a Google, that's a late night Google <laughs> later. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> that's the moment in the song where, when the songwriter in me says, damn, I wish I'd have thought of that. That's so good. Uh, that was a long time ago. Uh, that was uh, 30 years ago. Mm. So in redemption, in that song, what's beautiful about there's the hope of redemption. It's the cry. You can even feel it. I mean, when, when, you, when you're listening to the song, when you say that, when, when Derry sings that line, restore my soul, it, 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 um, it's a hopeful, you know, uh, petition, right? Mm -hmm. But there's no resolution. There's no, there's no voice going, okay. <laughs> it's yeah, just, not fixed. yeah, it's please. I want this, I need this, I'm hoping for this, but it just, it, and that's it. And it's, it's enough, it's beautiful. I think too, especially in that song, and this is to me, this is just the way I read it and the way I hear it, is the fact that you have your lyric, but the other component is the music. And I think the music tells the rest of the story. It's like when, you you, ha you have those, like, I call them the Arabian guitars. You have the Arabian guitar riff, right? Yeah. But then you have, like, this, you know, uh, to me, okay, the bass is this sort of the rock. Because it's just that boom, 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 boom. It's just like this steady freaking rock that's not going anywhere. And then uh, you have the drums. And, and I'm not just saying this, Steve, because you're the drummer. But it's like, to me, the drums are like what answer, the drums are the answer in that song because they're just explosive. And the, and the more the song goes, the more explosive the drums get. And, you, you know, so you have this, this amazing prayer of lyric, this cry, like a, it's, like a, it's like a modern day psalm, you know, punched into a rock and roll song with Arabian guitars and just wicked drums. And you're like, so I think that sometimes it's really cool to have like a lyric that tells part of the story and then the music uh, delivers the rest of the story. Yeah, and it's up to the listener to decide like how all that works for them. I think that's, mm -hmm. that to me is awesome. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, I also wanted to say, I, I love how you kind of break the rules on that lyrically, um, on that song, because you rhyme earth with earth, and you rhyme night with night, and you rhyme sin with sin, and I think it's awesome. It's one of those things where it's like, you know, uh, another songwriter might be, oh, well, no, you can't do that, don't do that. But it's like, no, I know what I'm doing, and I'm, I'm doing this on purpose, this is exactly what I'm doing, mm -hmm. that intentionality of it, and it's, it's so great, man. Uh, that is definitely one of those lyrics that, 
um, uh, just on that whole record, there's so many great lyrics, but that's one of my favorite ones. I, I want to say too about you saying about the drums. It made me. It made me think of. Um, I think. I think you guys have like that song. That drum track is so powerful. It reminds me of like um, when the levee breaks. You know, the Led Zeppelin run that opening. Uh huh. That it, that drum is just makes that song. It, it doesn't even matter what else happens in that song. Huh. Yeah. No, it's a loop. I'm not playing. Can you just, can you just send me the drum track to that, please? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, we yeah. had this new, new recording device, some new sampler, like the idea of looping things was new. This is like 1989, you know? And so the engineer had this thing and we could record my drums and loop it, you know? And so I remember that beat, you know, doom, bat, boom, ba boom, bat. I couldn't do it with my kick drum. I don't have a very good kick drum foot. I got this little skinny leg, you know, I do the best I can. But I wanted to do it with my floor tom, you know, doom, bat, boom, ba boom, bat. But I didn't want my hands crossed over like this, you know. So I put the floor tom on the left and I put the hi hat on the right. Oh, shut, and just like sitting there. And and so I could wasn't crossed over, you know, I could go chick, chick, bat, chick, 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 bat, you know, get a really clean shot at it. And then um, I used to had a tambourine in my left hand, a wood round tambourine, because I would not not touch a tambourine that's not wooden and round. But uh, I'm, I'm playing the snare drum and the floor tom with the tambourine. And that's the deal. That's oh, the deal. Yeah. Wow. And we looped it. And it just goes the whole six minutes. Uh, I think I overdubbed a couple cymbal crashes or something. But at the very end, then we kicked into that jam. You know, then it was the opposite because that was just free, a free, crazy, yeah, what thing. And that was a whole nother <laughs> but I was still holding, then I put the tambourine in my right hand and I was doing the beat, dude, get, 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 hitting the toms and everything with the tambourine. It sounds so sloppy and crazy. Yeah. Anyway. So I have to ask you this about that tune. It's like, okay, so after you got that, that take, that recording where you're like, where you come out of it, you're in the studio. Did you guys know at that point, did you go like, oh, we, we, there is something here. We've caught something here. Like, or did you just go, okay, that's another one. Let's move on to the next two. It's like, to me, I, I can imagine not being thrilled after capturing like sort of like the final take on that, on that tune. It just, it evolved. We spent a lot of time on that record. We were in, Jerry had his own place. So we were in the studio for like 10 weeks, you know, we only had nine songs. So we, we spent a lot of time just ruminating. And I don't think there was anything ever that was like, yeah, we got it, it's great. It was, everything took a long time to evolve. So I, I, that, it was a struggle. So I wouldn't say that I don't remember those moments when it was just like, this is great, you know? Yeah, yeah. That, sometimes I feel that more now. We're way more relaxed now. We were really uptight back then. <laughs> no, I get that. I get that. You know, really trying really hard, you know? <laughs> oh, I get it. But it was worth the effort. It still yeah. stands up, man. Still it stands does. up. It really does. All right, Chris, what you got, man? Um... <clears throat> Okay, since we're, uh, I'm gonna do another one from the Lovers Thieves. Yeah, and uh, I like that tonight for sure. I, I mean, I'm gonna, I'm downloading, getting along with that tonight. You'll get at least oh, two, very cool. Get at least very two cool. <laughs> tonight. <laughs> um, this was a song where I wanted to write about sort of my depression, and uh, I wasn't sure how to approach it for the longest time, and then I just decided to to make uh, this album has a few characters in it it has you know the enemy and it has uh um just a few different characters that i'm either singing through or, or or talking about and the idea of turning depression into a, another character like is like if that's that person's name is depression as opposed to um that that feeling uh that sort of cloud of sadness that sort of drapes over you. So um, so I decided to do that. And the reason I called it Glorified Song of Depression is because I had just gone to, what do they call those things? The, uh, oh man, gospel brunch. It was like a gospel brunch hour somewhere. Gospel and they had like the sanctified song of this and the glorified song of that and all these kind of titles. And I thought, oh, I'm just going to take one of those. And so I call it the glorified song of depression. So that's why it's called that. Okay. But it goes like this. I found myself under a rock 
that didn't stop the clock. I moved up north for some fresh air. You still found me there. All my life I've been running from trouble, buried deep under the rubble, and you found me there. I'm sliding down to my elevation. I'm moving on up to a new location. You found me there. I built my house on a sad foundation. I'm moving on up to a new location. You found me there. Worry without, worry within. Am I running from or running to sin? You found me there. Raising hell, making a mess, can't shake the turbulence. You found me there. I'm sliding down to my elevation. I'm moving on up to a new location, and you found me there. I built my house on a sad foundation. Moving on up to a new location, you found me there. I'm rolling down the hill in a busted barrel. I crash into the tree of peril. You found me there. Every night I drive into a ditch. I wake up every morning like a son of a bitch, and you found me there. Sliding down to my elevation, moving on up to a new location, and you found me there. I'm moving on up, sliding down, moving on up, sliding down. Mm. Wow. It's like the, that, the movement of sometimes the action, you're like taking us on an adventure. Yeah. You know? It's cool to hear you say that. I haven't talked about this album with anybody before. Uh, it's still, I put it out, it's still super new. Um, you know, the, the song itself, when I first recorded the demo, what I decided to do, like I thought, I've always wanted to do like an acapella song. And I was trying to figure out how to do it. So what I did was I scoured, instead of like going to find like really great singers around town, I decided to do make things really hard for myself and just like scour the internet and I would sample bits and pieces of like like female singers going glory or you know just like one word little bits and pieces and I'd sample a choir going Ooh, and I'd have all and so I compiled all these things and then I sang over the top of them like in falsettos and created this thing. And so I create so the whole song at the the demo version was was just a drum loop and then like um and then like all these different vocals i'd have this guy going mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so i have and so i would just sort of insert them so it was like just me and a bunch of sampled voices wow. and it sounds like a gospel song and then um i knew i wanted to make this into a real record and so i got my friend misty jones uh to produce it and she's just this amazing remix artist and producer and so misty took it and i swear to you like this song starts off like you're playing a video game turns into like an arena rock song and then ends with this gospel that whole gospel choir she left all that stuff in there and i was like oh because I, and i told her when she produced it, i said i don't i'm not going to micromanage it like i did my part I trust you. Like, I wouldn't do that with everybody, but with certain people that you trust, you just kind of go, all right. And so when I got it back, it was like Christmas morning and put it on the headphones and you're like, oh my God, you know, I was just so excited. I couldn't wait. Like, I don't know how in the world to play it live. I'll probably just play it with just me and an acoustic guitar, but I'm like, this is so freaking good. So it has all this, yeah, there's, a, there's definitely a sense of adventure in that song for sure, but it's really, really cool to hear you say that just upon hearing a lyric so yeah oh gosh i'm going every which way up and down and every which way you're just like it's like you're like a jackrabbit going through the brush and we're following you you know it's really uh yeah <laughs> i love that thank right. you yeah man yeah i like the rhythm of it too like even as you're reading it it's like you can't help but just start we you know bobbing and 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 I go into the rhythm of it. There's just, it's got a great rhythm just all the way through it. Awesome. I like the rhyme, the commitment to the rhyme. I mean, I'm a rhymer, you know, I like stuff to rhyme up. James Taylor School, you know. Yeah. 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 So I, I like that. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I love James Taylor. He's amazing. Oh, cool. All right. Well, I'm going to do one real quick, I guess. Um, hmm. Which one should I do? I will do. Um, Say, this is from the same record. Um, I guess I'll do this one. This is the first track on this uh, on the album we did. It's called uh, the song is "Dig." Um, dig my grave, dig it deep, 
and find all the secrets that I tried to keep. Repeat the words I never said, meaningless now that I'm dead. Why do I keep this secret of love? Where did I learn this silent tongue? I confess my fear, I confess my love, confess my sins to the Lord above. A tooth for a tooth and a nail for my sin, hands in the flame and I'm hungry again. Word into flesh and there's flesh on the nail and my flesh is the temple and you're tearing the veil. Wow. So, not a lot of hope in that one. So, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. my favorite part in that one, I, I, I just, I, I really got off on how I kind of um, did like word into flesh and flesh on the nail and flesh is the temple and you're tearing the veil. Like how all those different images kind of domino and fall back on each other. That's my favorite part of it. Like yeah. if I got done the whole song like that. I would have. I, I liked how that kind of came together. But it's visceral. Fun stuff. Yeah. Well, we've been uh, we've been going for about an hour here, guys. Well, it was good. It was good. I enjoyed hanging out with you guys. Yeah. Yeah. This has been. It's really nice for me, even though it's odd being on a phone and a computer to do it. But it's I don't get a chance to do this with people, even in my own hometown. Just sit around and talk about the songwriting process or lyrics or, you know, so this to me is super refreshing because I feel like I'm coming out of my bubble <laughs> that I've, my, I'm bo the, the boy in the self-imposed bubble for years. I just decided, all right, I'm just going to go make music and not worry about the rest of the world. So it's really nice to kind of meet with people that I love and respect and, and uh, Steve, especially like mm. ever since I was a teenager to be able to kind of, have your records. I used, you know, I used to have to smuggle, like smuggle the choir album or the choir cassette tapes into my house because I had a father who made me burn all my albums. Like oh. in a yeah, that was a whole that's a whole other subject for another time. But I had uh, the Joshua Tree and Circle Slide and uh I think an Adam Again record um hidden wow. in, in between my mattresses. Because mm. if it wasn't Dallas Home and Praise or something like that, it wasn't one of those obvious like Christians in a sweater smiling on the front cover. It was uh, questionable in my house. Yeah. So thank you for sharing this time with me. It's super cool. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, I, I got to say too, like um, my fr when I first discovered uh, the choir and and uh, that there was this whole other world of music, like you know, in high school and stuff and, and going into college, I, I listened to just, you know, real music, just, you know, rock music and whatever was out there. Um, and all my friends who are Christian and older people would tell me, oh, oh, you like rock and roll? You should listen to Petra. You should listen to, you know, like, Ugh. and it was just like, no, no, I'm, the coloring song, it just wasn't doing it for me. Um, and, uh, and a friend of mine, I was taking a college, a creative writing class, actually. And my friend Kent, uh, Williamson gave me a ride to my car from from where we were having the class. So I jump in his car, and I think he was. I think he had the choir. I think he had uh, it was either Kangaroo or Diamonds and Rain or something. But and I was first. I mean, I just was like, "Wow, who's this band? This is flipping awesome!" And then he says, "Yo, it's the choir. You know, and there these guys are Christians." And then like he he had all these cassettes in his floor, you know, and there's like Undercover Seventy Sevens at him again, and and I'm like holy moly i didn't even know this stuff existed it was like suddenly this like you know everything opened up for me of like can i borrow these because <laughs> this is awesome and that was my first realization of like there's this whole other world of music out there that's actually really good you know like it's good music it's good lyrics it's it's about real life it's not pretentious it's not trying to you know it's not trying to compete with amy grant or anything um yeah and i just want to thank you for that man you 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 set me free. <laughs> uh, well, we're all lucky to still be at it, still tr be trying. You know, we haven't got, haven't gotten far, but you know, we keep on getting to do it. So I guess that's success. That is, yeah, I think it is. Yeah. I'm excited about your new record, man. Yeah, yeah, hear it. And you too, Chris. Actually, I'm excited for both of those. 
to hear what you guys did on in the well, it's, Chris's thing is going to be fun, different. Cool. Yeah. Good well, stuff. I'm I'm just grateful. I'm grateful to, to be able to wake up and make music every day, whether people get to hear it or not. It's a it's it's rewarding and um, it's you know a, almost like a form of meditation for me, whether it's you know painting or making music or something like that. And then to be able to share this kind this kind kind of time with you guys is super precious to me. So thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. Appreciate it very much. I will uh, I'll get this posted and I will tag you guys and appreciate your time. Thanks for doing it, guys. All right. Thanks, Keith, for for throwing the party. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anytime. Right. Take care, guys. Good night. All right. Bye.